So thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm very sorry that I, I couldn't go. I'm uh, doing a lot of teaching these days. All right, so, so let me explain uh, what I'll try to do. I'll, I'll try to, pre to present three models or examples, really, which are three examples of mean film games with impulse control. None of them have a common noise. And both of, all of them are like a one dimensional case, essentially. And they have a very simple kind of global coupling in terms of mean field games. These are um, also the three examples. They, they are like, a, they have a sort of opposite inequality as the monotonicity of uh, Las Villon. So they are, I guess, anti monotone. And that's because of the interest in economics is many times in that case, uh, which is typically refers to strategic complementarity. And I will be looking at perturbations from an initial uh, equilibrium that, for an equilibrium that is an steady state. So this will be, in principle, infinite horizon. They'll have a stationary solution. And I'll be looking at um, initial conditions that are close to the one from the steady state. And then I want to think about the characterization of the equilibrium path that it will ensue after having an initial condition that is different. Okay, so um, these, are, these examples are, are, are stylized versions of models that we use a lot in economics. So, so I think that this, this talk is probably gonna be very different from the other talks because it's mostly like presenting examples and instead of giving you results, it's more like asking questions. I'm hoping that uh, people will be interested in working in areas that myself and other people like myself are, will be like uh, uh, users. So let me say this is sort of based on uh, on three papers. E each of the examples correspond to a different paper. One, it's a paper with Rob Scheimer and, and uh, Katka Warivikova, a paper with Francesco Lippi and, and Takis Uranides, uh, and which is the one that mostly taught us about meaningful games, and another paper with uh, Francesco, David Argente, uh, Mendes, and Diana Umpate. OK, so these are like, but they are closely related models. They, have a seem, they, they seem to have some similarities, what I like to highlight. And it's really not my comparative static to think about uh, what are the general properties. That's what I hope that people will actually be able to, uh, to explain. And, and, and maybe, maybe there is some of this in the literature. But one example of one advantage of this example is that they are relatively simple to characterize and very also very simple to solve numerically. And, uh, and that's, why that's why we use them really. So I want to kind of uh, um, uh, concentrate on, on examples that are really for which there is demand, so to speak, that, that we really use in economics. So let me just go more into the details. So the three examples, we have a, a single state, let's say X is gonna be um, a real number. In one example, it will be like uh, underlined, there will be a Brownian motion that it will be controlled in some way or another one. And then in the, uh, in the first example also, I will keep track of um, another variable that will be some age. Uh, and in the last example also, I will be keep track of some sort of simple state. But essentially the state will be X. And uh, there'll be a Brownian and underlying with some variance, the problems will have all, all discounted. And in, in two of the problems, it will be a fixed cost that are gonna use the letter C for it. And the flow period return, uh, say a script F, will depend on the cross-sectional density, but I'm gonna use like a very simple way of coupling, which is really typically what is used in a lot of economics models, maybe a multi-dimensional version, but a form like this, that the peer return function will depend on the state of the individual agent and in some moment of the cross-sectional distribution or, or some very simple uh, linear function of the cross-sectional distribution. And there will be the examples that I'll have, I'll try to have all of them with the same notation and then go through a special case even in the examples in which I could just uh, dial in a parameter that will give you the strength of the coupling. In fact, how anti-monotone the models are. Okay, and just to set them in the notation, so I'm gonna use V for the value function and M for the uh, density. And again, it will depend on X and time. Remember, there's no common noise. And in some examples also may depend on, on, the, on some other age, but um, 
that will be incidental. And then my notation will be that a bar on top of the value function will be the solution of the mean field gain in the stationary case. That is, imagine that you have an initial condition so that the stationary distribution the distribution is stationary. Okay, so, so the notation is V and for the value function, M for the measure, and a bar on top of them for the stationary solution. So do, they do not depend on time. And the real the idea why I want to consider the following uh, um, sort of finite horizon problem, although sometimes we're gonna let T to go to infinity, cap T to go to infinity, is because I want to imitate a lot of the things that we do in economics when we solve these models numerically. Uh, so we do some form of shooting that we basically um, force the problems to go to a stationary state in a finite horizon. So, uh, so then I want to write a problem from the very beginning as a way that people solve them numerically. You will also see that in these examples are very, very simple, which if you read most economic, most economic papers, they are not. So I hope that this will be will provide a bit of a bridge to, to then uh, being able to as an economist to, to learn more about the results that are needed and also to present examples that are you know, compact enough so that can be analyzed also. All right, so let's go to the very first example. This is extremely simple, but it has a lot of the same structure. It is an example that we use, so, but, but I won't enter into the economics of why we use it or what is the data for which we use it. I'm just gonna explain the basic structure. So imagine that agents, they're trying to minimize the expected scanted value of the flow, F, depends on the state X and this coupling, which is going to be the first moment of the cross-sectional distribution. And X, when it's uncontrolled, follows a drift, uh, a Brownian motion without drift. And then there are stopping times. They are given to each agent. The, 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 these stopping times are IID, across agents and determine when an agent could adjust its state. So think about this to be the survival function. So one minus this is the CDF of the, of the times and think about the little h to be the hazard rate that is instantaneous probability. So this is a given function. It's, there's no choice here. This is part of the data of the, of the problem. And here I wrote down the, um, the PDE for the value function, although it's easier to think about a probabilistic uh, setup for the very simple model. But the idea is that an, an agent has a given X, it has, has this uh, X for a period of time tau, and then it gets this, uh, um, it gets this flow, then X changes through time and time changes age, the, the value of x ages. And then with this probability, with that particular age, it's allowed to change the state. And in that case, you will choose a new value, r. I'm going to use r in the three models for the, for the optimal return. So it will choose an r when it's allowed to change. And then the value function will no longer going to be this one, but it will be one in which the new spell will have 0, h, and it will start at the position r. And this value function holds for every time less than t. And at t, I will assume that, it's, that the continuation is the one from steady state. So think about that the coupling ceases to exist after um, cap t. OK, so I hope that this is clear. The main example is that cap x is really the cross-sectional average of little x, and that f is just the difference between little x and the average multiplied by a constant theta. So essentially, if theta is positive, then obviously agents would like to do something similar to the average. And, uh, and that obviously is like anti-monotone, right? I mean, if we go through like a very simple computation, we'll see that if we uh, compute this inequality, we are just gonna get the opposite sign of the last trillion. So, but it's just easier to see it here, right? Because you really want to do something, if theta is positive, something similar to what the average person is doing. And that's really the, the model that we're interested in economics. Let me not enter why, but it's really like the, at least in this setup, which is a model applied to how prices are being set, is, is a case of interest. Okay. So now let me just kind of finish the description of the, 
of, of the model. Of course, actually, this one is so simple that it can be solved entirely uh, because it's such a simple model. But I want to do it as uh, as a, to to point out some similarities when other models that are um, well, first of all, it is useful in economics, but also similarities with other models. So remember, the idea is that every time that the agent in this stop in time says, look, you could choose your X, then it solves this problem. It has no reference to the continuation because after that, then uh, the agent will, will not be able to choose its own X until again, there is a stop in time that will tell when the agent is allowed to change. So this is the survival function. This is the discounting. This is the expected value of the, of the return. And this is the R that was chosen at the very beginning of the drift, uh, of, sorry, very beginning of the, when this, when it has the opportunity to change and it's gonna keep this probabilistically uh, with these probabilities. And we're integrating, we're taking expected value with respect to this uh, uh, winner process. And remember X, capital X is just this deterministic path. So we're gonna solve for R then as a function of the future values of X. And that will be like the optimal decision rules. So I'll come back to this in a second for the very simple case. But before that, let me think also about kind of the equivalent of what will be the Forker Planck that in this very simple model, we could, we could define the distribution of an age after an agent has made a decision. So an agent had made a decision, had chose to change the value of X, and then we could think about what is the fraction on the cross section of the firms, well, sorry, of the agents that have made a decision S periods ago. And it's essentially proportional to the survival. And, uh, is a survival divided by the integral of the survival function. Let's just think it through it. How, are, how, you know, when was the last time that each firm has made a decision? So this is the fraction of firms that have made a decision S periods ago. And then with this, it's very easy to compute, say the first moment, we need to remind ourselves that X when it's uncontrolled is a martingale. And every time when X was chosen, was set at a value RT, Remember that it depends on T because it, de it depends on the path of X starting at T to, to cap T. The cross-sectional value of X will be just, um, we, we could count how many firms have chosen X periods ago and they have chose this value. And in the cross-section then each of them is a martingale. So we'll average out all the, all the other path. And then there is an, uh, an extra contribution that comes from initial conditions of the problem, which is a contribution of whatever it was the initial conditions, they have some given X, and then this is a martingale. So we could also take the, the cross-sectional average of those at that time. Okay, so, so let me write this as this value, this variable is related to the past values of the optimal decision rules, and is related to whatever propagation we have of initial conditions. So in this case, this is sort of exact. There's really no approximations because it's a very, very simple problem. But just to get ahead of the problems that, are, that we want to study, I want to think about that the initial condition will be starting on the invariant distribution and then perhaps uh, perturbing this with some perturbation P where epsilon will be like a, a scalar and I'll be basically differentiated with respect to epsilon. Okay, so hopefully this sort of gives you the structure of how the equilibrium is going to look like. R is going to be a function of future X's, and each X is a function of future R's. This one is linear, and this one, well, well it's in general, it's not linear, but I'm just going to perturb it, so I'm going to make it into a set of linear equations. Just to set up the notation, I'm going to use hats, sorry for the Objects we know, uh, the decoration are the, or the original value functions. Objects with a bar are the stationary ones. An object with a hat are the perturbations. That is, they are the derivative with respect to epsilon. Epsilon is how much? So let me just remind you. Epsilon is the perturbation is you start at the steady state plus epsilon p. So I'm going to differentiate with respect to epsilon and, and set epsilon equal to c. So the perturbations are, imagine solving the equilibrium for a given epsilon, differentiate with epsilon, 
and then evaluate at epsilon equal to zero as a standard. Now, all the calculations in these papers are formal. So let me explain also <laughs> something. Like in economics, formal actually means rigorous, which I gather that is the, the opposite than in math, which is perfect for my talk. Because for the economists, this would look like rigorous, but uh, for the mathematicians, they will understand that it's not. But anyway, so I'm gonna keep with my formal argument. So, um, so these are the, these objects we had are the are the perturbations, and um, we just discussed uh, that this this that the um, equivalent of the um, fokker plan equation is linear on the previous decision rules, if we are coupling with respect to the cross-sectional average. And then now we're going to linearize the optimal decision rules and also gonna get another linear equation. So it's going to look like this. So let me just uh, um, go back and announce how it's going to look. Uh, this here is the equation that I wrote down before. It's really accounting by the distribution of ages. And this will be the equation for the optimal decision rule, which will be linear because we're just uh, 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 expanding this. Now, what is interesting is also that, uh, and I'm going to call W these coefficients, and the O is for optimality, and the A is for aggregation. And this structure will be the same in all the examples. This is a very simple example, but this structure will be the same in all of them. And you could see that then the way you will solve it this is a system of two linear equations. So you replace it here, and then you will get, say, an equation on x, a linear equation on x. And uh, where theta will show up, uh, so it will be really like an integral equation where theta will be um, uh, giving you the strength of the anti monotonicity. So let me, before getting to that, let me just uh, uh, make another comment that will reappear in sort of uh, more complex cases. This is really the first of the conditions for the value of R. And uh, so this is the derivative with respect to X. Remember it has two arguments, the flow, your X and the average of everybody's X. So at the beginning of uh, when a decision can be made, the initial condition has to be chosen uh, to minimize uh, the objective function, so it will satisfy this equation. And of course, if we differentiate with respect to epsilon, it's just a trivial calcul uh, calculus exercise, we'll obtain an expression for R. And this will be some weighted average of the cross derivatives relative to the second derivatives. So this is typically the, what it will happen in any game, right? The cross derivative relative to the second derivative will tell you whether you want to imitate the rest of the players or you want to do something else. So if we go back to this very simple example, this quadratic example, then this will be the optimal decision rules. So I want to point out, make the following comment. The optimal decision rules have the same coefficient that, the, that we use for the law of motion of, of X, that is for the, for the focal plank, except that there is discounting and except that there is a, a, the value of theta here. And this structure will recur in the three examples. And I wonder how general this is. And this is something that I don't know. I mean, I'm really asking kind of for help and hoping that people understand better what is the structure of these problems. So just to summarize. So the solution of this problem of the, the linearization, it has a focal plank equation that has just propagation uh, using a constant R and then looking back at the history with these given coefficients that are given in terms of the, the function h, and then the optimal uh, decision rule, which is just have the coefficient theta, the, st the strength of the coupling, and then essentially the same coefficients. The only difference between these two is this counting here and not this counting in this. So I include here the expressions. And then of course you get this linear equation. So the solution is the solution of this linear equation. This will be true in the three examples. So this linear equation has the propagation using the decision rules in a steady state. It will depend then on the initial perturbation, but it doesn't depend on anything else. Then you will have this coefficient theta. I will show the three examples that it will have just this theta that will pop out outside. 
and they will have a kernel that doesn't depend on theta. And in this case, it depends only on this function h. And it has some structure, this kernel, and then you have the x on both sides. So this is a very simple equation. Uh, you know, it's an integral equation, second kind, first kind type of equation. So we know a lot about its properties. So in, in particular, you know, we could think about defining, this is a particular expression. It's not quite a convolution, but, you know, so the particular expression for K. If you go through the, through the argument, you will see very simply that this always have a sign. Also, it's easier to see that, uh, um, to find like an L1 norm for it. Um, and in this case, actually, except for theta, this is less than one. So this will be very nice to think about the properties of it. For finite t, and I want to come back to this, to think about an L2 norm, and then it has a finite L2 norm, even though k actually, it's, um, it's not finite in every, you know, in the diagonal it will be infinite, but, but it's well enough behaved so that, um, it will be a, 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 the, the L2 norm will be finite. So if we think of this as a linear operator in L2, we'll get, we're gonna get compactness. See that given the structure that is so similar, the, the optimal decision rules and the form of the focal plank, then uh, this uh, operator will be self-adjoint and it will be positive definite. Self-adjointness with respect to this uh, weight and norm, where the weight is just, the, including the discount, because the discount obviously enters in the optimal decision rules, but it doesn't enter into the propagation on the Kolmogorov forward. So this has a bunch of uh, properties that it will be essentially true in the other examples. One is obviously if theta is less than one, not just close to zero, just a smaller than one, then this will be a contraction. So we'll have an, a unique uh, bounded solution. This will keep being true even if t is infinity. And if t is finite, for which case it will we have this, um, um, in, in the case in which we have a, a, that this is a self-adjoint operator is, is, uh, and it's com well, well, it's compact, then we can write it in terms of the um, eigenfunctions of the operator. And uh, we have, of course, uh, conditions for a uniqueness of the solution. So as long as lambdas are the eigenvalues, theta times lambda is less than one, we have a solution. I want to return to this. There's something kind of strange, and I really don't quite understand it. So this is a weird talk. I'm actually spreading ignorance as opposed to knowledge. But the part that it's strange to me is I'm, I'm expecting that a model in which theta is very large is a model that are multiple equilibrium. But here the equilibrium is of the perturbation either exists and is unique or it doesn't exist. On the other hand, when you go from lambdas that you first, you go to the dominant eigenvalue and you, you take a theta that you just cross theta times lambda equal to one, obviously around that, the equilibrium is not well posed because it will go discontinually from one point to the other one. So what is actually the interpretation of that? I'll return to that. It's not sort of clear what to do with this case. And I'll return to that because this will be true in a more, in a model that I'm kind of more interested to. But that's why I'm saying that, for instance, if we go with initial conditions, remember this X hat with a zero is just a propagation of initial conditions using the steady state decision rules, the constant R in this case. If this object say will have a sign, as it is in many economic problems, then this will be the, uh, the dominant again function will have a sign. So this uh, will have a sign. So we know actually that as theta goes to one over lambda one, which is a number that is less, well, slightly bigger, could be bigger than one, it could be like one or bigger, then X is gonna go, you know, it's gonna be divergent. So what is interpretation of that, of this pole? Or, you know, anyway, I'll come back to this. So now let me go to the second model. You'll see that it's very similar. The second model, and for most of the example, think of the same type of um, a flow, uh, cost x minus theta cap x. But now instead of having every agent deciding at randomly, at random times, every agent could decide to change in its own x by paying a fixed cost. Okay. So then think about this is the, the problem that the agents will solve. They like to minimize 
the flow, uh, the discounted value of their flow uh, cost, but they pay, uh, oops, sorry, this is, uh, so, but they pay, um, um, they pay this cost at, uh, at times that are chosen. So now the stopping times are chosen and it will be like an SS type of model. And at cap T, then we return, um, we use as a, as a boundary condition that values are equal to the ones from the stationary problem. So a stationary problem will be the one where X is constant. Okay, so, so this is like a standard SS model. It will have an upper barrier, the optimal decision rules for each team will have an upper barrier, we have a lower barrier, and we, has, we will have an optimal return point. So this is the part that is similar to the previous model. Of course, what is different is that we need to choose the upper barrier and the lower barrier. So if you think about this for every T, the value function will look something like this. Let's say this is the, the well-behaved case. So this is the cost, then this will be the range in which, um, this will be the range of inaction, then this will be the range in which control will be exercised. When control is exercised, then the value will go from this one to this one by paying the cost. Uh, I'm assuming that the, it's well behaved so that it's C1, but not C2 around this point. And that when it returns here, this has to be a minimum. So this will be flat at this point. So I'm gonna be using basically the boundary conditions that there's continuity in this point. And then also that the first derivative here and here and here are zero. So I'm assuming that I have a classic, I will be assuming that I have a classical solution. And just to give you like a graphical representation of a typical path, just in case I was not clear, let's say that this will be how the barriers move through time, these three uh, lines, then this will be a typical sample path. And then when it hits a barrier, it will be returned to the optimal return point. Then there's another, then the sample path continues, hits a barrier, it gets returned and so on and so forth. So notice that it's similar to the previous case in which the times were exogenously given stopping times. Now they are chosen uh, subject that you pay a fixed cost. Now we could think about uh, what is the uh, hamilton bellman jacobi equation. It will be, you know, sort of the standard type of equation. So, you know, you have your flow value that depends on, on X, um, each term changes on time. But this equation holds only within these two barriers. And of course, we need to find the two barriers. But in this classical solution, we're going to assume that this equation holds between these two barriers. And then, the, then it will be continuous. So at the lower barrier or at the upper barrier, it will take the same value that is in the optimal point plus the fixed cost. So I'm just saying. At this point, it will be the same as this plus the fixed cost for every t. So that's the second equation. This has to hold for every t. And then I'm assuming that the solution is well behaved enough so that the derivative at the boundaries of the range of inactions are equal to zero because outside the range of inaction, the value function is constant. So I'm assuming that it's C1, that, it, that we have a classical solution. And in the interior, it reaches a minimum in R, so the derivative will have to be equal to zero. At uh, capital T, I'm assuming that uh, the, bound, the, the terminal condition, then the continuation is the one from a steady state. Now, if cap T is infinity, this, is, this will not be playing a role, but I'll do this for cap T final and take limits. So then let, let me go back. So then given X and given B bar, then we are solving for a value function just incidentally, just to solve for the policies, which is the path of L, R, and U. That's the same. I'm just reminding you of this graph, just in case I wasn't clear of how the optimal decision may look like. And then there's a corresponding uh, Fokker plan or Kolmogorov 4 equation. Uh, it's really like a, um, in the interior, when X is in between the, the two barriers, then um, it's just a heat equation. I'm assuming that it's continuous at the barriers. So everywhere it outside is equal to zero and it's exactly equal to zero in the barriers. So I'm assuming that it's continuous in X. 
and then that it preserves mass. Okay. And then we are given an initial condition. So that's just, this is kind of a standard. So the only point is we need to remind ourselves that the uh, heat equation does not hold on the optimal return point because there is no local argument here since there is a point in which there is a flux of probability that is centering, right? Like when you go from here, there's also like a non-local contribution from the flux of probability that comes here from here. Okay, so then solving this sort of analogously is given these decision rules and given the initial conditions, uh, we're solving for M and then given M, we could uh, compute our coupling. Okay, so I think that that's, hopefully it's kind of clear enough. This is not a simple problem. I think that uh, Charles, which I, I'm not sure if it's here, but he was in the previous talk, um, has said sort of like, I believe he was giving his dissertation and said uh, beautiful papers about like a, a closely related topic. Uh, here I'm assuming that everything is it's a uh, it's a slightly different it's a, it's a slightly different uh, problem. I'll I'll talk about it, another problem that is, is closer to 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 Bertucci's uh, uh, I believe dissertation. Um, and uh, um, but but let me remind you sort of uh, uh, what I'm taking to be the stationary solution. The stationary solution is the one in which x is constant, and in that case, this will be just three numbers because they're not gonna be changing through time. And then the initial condition that I like to think about is you start from the state state plus a perturbation. And again, then I want to think now about the value function and the cross-sectional density where I want to think about the, the perturbations. The, so the derivative respect to epsilon uh, for a given P evaluated when epsilon is equal to zero, I want to think about they are the same as before. So every object with a hat has that interpretation but so will be the L and the U. So what is the advantage of this now? Well, the advantage is that this is a difficult problem. This general problem is difficult because you need to find out what are these uh, uh, boundaries. And uh, while for the perturbation, uh, this is a much simpler problem because at epsilon equal to zero, then all these functions will be defined in a given uh, domain. Basically, this will have a rectangular domain. So that will make it much easier. All right, so then, then this will, be, will give rise to a system of PDEs and boundary conditions. So basically there will be a hamilton bemal jacobi equation for a perturbation. It's very similar to the one that is before. Notice that this now will have as a source the period of return evaluated at a constant value for the state state, the derivative of this object times the perturbation and then the rest is just a heat equation, but on a given rectangular domain. So this is really like very simple. And then you have the perturbation from the value mark, well, the, for the conditions, so the boundary conditions that we had before, but given my assumption that we have a classical solution, it just becomes that at the boundaries, the perturbation are equal to each other. This perturbation at the upper boundary for every T is equal to the value function evaluated at u for every t and is equal to the value function at r equal t. The other terms here have no contributions given the assumption that I have a smooth a solution that is classical. So the derivative evaluated at L bar is equal to zero. Terminal condition is that a cap t, the, the derivative is equal to zero. So why is it equal to zero? Because there's no more coupling. And if you just perturb the, uh, the initial condition, well, after cap T, it doesn't really matter where the rest of the agents are doing. So this will be, this is true in all the examples. Okay, so this is a very simple problem now if you think about these conditions. It's really like a, some, you know, after some transformation, it's just uh, the heat equation. Now there is one more set of boundary. Okay, so that's useful. So that's just the heat equation. You could then imagine given a source given by X hat, then you could solve this PDE with these boundary conditions, you have your B hat. And then there is one more boundary condition, which is the derivative of the derivative of this equation, the derivative of this equation, the so one that says that the derivative on the space X at the boundaries are zero. So the perturbation of that will give us another set of equations that involves perturbation of the barriers and the derivatives of the value function. 
So let me, let me just say it again. So the structure of this is once you get your perturbation, you get basically like a standard um, heat equation where the coupling just uh, shows us a source. You solve that equation. And then after that, once you have the derivative of the value function, then you could find out what should be the implied perturbation for the thresholds, which is these equations are here, these two equations. So, okay, so this is a very simple problem, right? Because it's just, and, and likewise, a similar argument will hold for a focal plank. You know, you have like, uh, basically, it's a linear, it, it's a linear PD, so you have basically the, the perturbation will be the same equation on a given rectangular domain, you will have basically um, mass conservation. And then you will have <clears throat> the derivatives at the boundary. Because remember, the density at the boundary, given that assuming that I have a classical solution, is zero. So this is where the coupling of the optimal decision rules will enter. So let me just say it again. We are solving for, we want to solve for x bar as an intermediate step. We're solving for the perturbation of the density given now the decision rules, given this perturbation for decision rules. So we, what we do is we have the perturbation of the focal plank, and then it's also some version of the heat equation. This is a slightly more, um, you know, less well-behaved because of having this optimal return point and where there's no differentiability, but, uh, but it's not, you know, so different. And then once you have M hat, then you have your x. For instance, in the symmetric case, if, the decision, if, the, if f will be symmetric and there's no drift, it's a very simple case. In the symmetric case, we could essentially solve the entire problem. I'll, I'll make a comment before solving the entire problem that each of these, uh, this comment I think is kind of obvious. It's just my own, um, but each, the solution of the perturbation for the value function and the solution of the perturbation for the density, they're all linear um, functions of, for instance, the, the value function is just a linear function of the perturbation coupling. And the solution of the density is just linear in the perturbations for the optimal decision rule. So that always will give you this linear set of equations, which I'm here just sketching. So this always will be a linear set of equations. Now this is a set of equations that is more complex because there are three boundaries, but it's essentially very similar to the previous case. So at the end, let me just skip this. But at the end, what happens is that you end up solving, like in the previous case, that in the previous case, we have just R, the optimal return point, as a function of the future values of the cross-sectional average. Now here is also as a function of future value of the cross-sectional average. This is linear, just inheriting this from the fact that these are all uh, linear PDEs. So the boundaries work very nicely just to not have any other interaction, keeping the linearity. There's this counting. And these coefficients indeed are the same coefficients as the one in the focal plank. So you will have basically the only difference is this counting and that these are actually taking integrating future values as opposed to past values. Given the symmetry of the example, the, the lower uh, and the upper um, barriers, they move the same. And um, you know, we could actually compute uh, these coefficients are some sort of transforms. And I'm not gonna go over them, it's just a bit algebraically intensive, but you just compute them by solving the, by, by just doing some, using some Fourier expansion in, in your solution of the heat equation. All right, so, so let me actually go back to this. It's exactly the same equations that, I mean, formally it looks like the same equations we had before. We replace one and the other one and we have three terms. This term is propagation of the initial perturbation with the steady state decision rules. This term is a kernel that have a lot of structure, essentially the same structure as in the previous case. And then theta outside telling us the, the strength of the uh, strategic complementarity or the anti-monotonicity. So this kernel is defined in terms of these functions, W, the ones from, I'm using A for 
aggregation and O for optimality, but these two are proportional to each other and they only differ in one of them using discounting and the other one we are not using discounting. The kernel again, still have a sign, it's singular, but well behaved enough so that um, the L norm, it's less than or equal than one. And for T finite, it also have a, a L2 norm that is finite, so it will be compact in L2. I mean, the, the associated operator will be compact. With the same inner product, it will be self-adjoint, and it's also positive definite for essentially the same reason. So it has a very similar structure to this very simple problem. So what are the, what are the uh, consequences, same as before? For theta less than one, remember, this is actually very far away. I mean, it's, it's not just close to not having a coupling. It's really, you know, it could be a lot. <laughs> so, but for theta less than one, then this is a contraction. We have a unique L, L, L bounded solution, uh, even for T infinity. And for T finite, we still have the same, um, uh, we could rewrite the solution as a solution of this uh, integral equation. And again, the only place, let me just emphasize, these eigenfunctions do not depend on theta. They depend on all the other parameters, but they, are not, they do not depend on theta because they just depend on the kernel. On the, so theta only shows up here. So as you dial out the different theta, you're basically uh, changing the weighted average of these projections. So as theta is different from, if theta is, and, and you know, this is a sort of compact operator, it's self adjoint, so all these eigen, eigenvalues will be, you know, will have a discrete spectrum. So as theta is different from, it's not equal to any, if theta times lambda is different from one, then we'll have a unique solution. But as theta goes to one over lambda one, then this will be divergent. So this has uh, many interesting properties. For instance, if you look at this solution, remember, as I change theta, this doesn't change because it doesn't involve theta. It just involves a propagation of the initial uh, perturbation with the state state decision rules. The eigenfunctions depends just on the kernel, which is dependent of theta. So as you change theta, you could see that the solution is going to be changing. And in this case, we could show that the solution, it will be increasing in theta and it will be convex in theta. So it's kind of very nice because think about what it's saying. Eventually it will go to a pole because there will be no solution. And as you increase in strategic complementarity, you increase in anti-monotonicity, then the conversion to state state is slower, slower, slower until it doesn't go to a state state anymore. And in fact, if you set theta negative, then you just have a, a, the standard sort of last really on. So I, I will just not talk about that case. I think I miscalculated the time, so I have only three minutes. So I'm gonna give a very brief outline of the third case, and then I'm gonna set a bunch of questions that I, it would be great to have help. So the third case is much closer to Charles uh, 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 papers, uh, seminar papers. Um, there's a, far, there's a, I'll tell you the economics of it. We are studying actually using um, a payment app but the payment app is only good if some other people have a payment app. So we're studying the adoption of that. So, so then there's a birth and death process, and then um, which uh, occur with probability uh, nu, and then agents start their life without the app. They, with some probability, they die. They don't literally die, but they retire from the game and someone else take their place. Each of them have an X, which is a, a Brownian motion uh, that is uh, regulated between zero and one. So it has two, bar two reflective barriers. And it's really measuring the strength of, for some people, this app is very good. For some people, it's not so good. It changes and it changes through time. So the flow value that the agents would like to maximize is a product of, you know, it's zero if they don't have the app. And if they have the app, it depends on X. And it also depends on capital X. Now, capital X here is just a count of how many people have the app. Now, of course, we could do like more complicated functions. The important part of this function is that the cross derivative between little x and kappa x is positive. That's really the, so if theta is positive, this is anti-monoton too. So I'm not gonna go through details because I'm out of time, but this example, it doesn't have a symmetry that they have the other examples, but there's no optimal return point. 
the optimal decision rules is when you cross a barrier, you adopt. It has a stationarity because of the dearth and, and birth process. So they will have a stationary solution in which you will be like a constant, and we're going to be doing the same. We're going to be doing a perturbation around the stationary state. But here's something that is different. Stationary problem for, in this case, could have either no interior, no station, the, maybe there's no stationary state that is interior. Maybe there is one. I mean, we have a characterization in terms of the parameters. Maybe there are two. So this, this problem could have two stationary equilibrium. And then what we are interested in to study in the local behavior, the dynamics across the two interior state states. One has high activity, a lot of people that eventually will get this up. The other has, has low activity, few people that will, get, will have this up. So we want to study the local behavior following the same steps. So I'm not gonna go through them. They're sort of identical. The structure of the, of the equations so the, you know, Hamilton, Bellman, Jacobi, and the uh, Kolmogorov forward equation are similar. They're not the same, but they're very similar. Then you get this very similar looking set of equations, and then you get this very similar linear equation that you want to solve. But here there's a difference that this is a, it's a linearization around different steady states. Hence, the parameters will be different. And this is something of interest for us, at least in this case, that. Uh, First of all, this associated operator is not self-adjoint. So we don't quite understand the conditions in which it is and it isn't. We don't have a good grasp. Anyway, that's just something about ourselves. Um, but interesting, for instance, what we could show is that the high activity steady state is locally stable, but the low activity steady state is not stable. This is a quite interesting result because if you think about for policy, what you want to do is typically you want to say, well, maybe you need to have a big push because people by themselves, they will set in a bad equilibrium. But this type of result says that we should not observe the low state state equilibrium. So this is kind of like an advantage. Okay, so, and one more comment into the structure. If we actors were to solve the planner's problem, the planner problem, if we looked at the properties of its solution is very similar to the properties of the previous one. You know, they have this self adjoinness uh, this positive, definite, uh, so all the eigenvalues are positive. Um, so I'm, we don't understand exactly why there is these differences. Maybe there's just by chance, or maybe there's something deeper. So now let me just set a bunch of questions. So this is a very formal analysis. So we assume classical solutions everywhere. So obviously, you know, for many problems, we don't, we're interested in, we are fine on just, looking at the perturbations, but we don't really know what will be like good ways to think about um, problems with their non-classical solutions. Of course, almost everybody here is an expert on that. It's just not, not me. Then what is interpretation of not having, of, of the case in which TT is very large? I mean, I think this is just, these solutions are not well posed around that, but we expect as economists typically that if there is a lot of SRG complementarity, there should be no equilibrium. What we have is that there is an equilibrium that is that has poles that is discontinuous. So we're not quite sure. And this is interacting a little bit with the analysis that is this like a figment of our imagination or these are equilibrium? That is to say, we get compactness of K only with T is finite. How should, should we think about this? So perhaps we shouldn't really think about analyzing this type of equilibrium if they do not survive to T going to infinity. This is also our limitations of not understanding. But it, it's an interesting example to in cap T going to stay stay because this is what most of the algorithm that are using economics are doing. They're forcing the continuation to be the stay stay. So of course, you know, what will be the general conditions in which you have this to be self-adjoint or not? We don't quite understand that. What would be the general conditions for the local stability? We have examples and we could show where one equilibrium is locally stable, the other not, but I'm, I bet that there's something much more general of the type of, for instance, uh, uh, of the conditions that uh, Alessio discussed today. Um, also, let me just jump into this because I'm out of time. Um, we are studying one of these problems, uh, um, also the convergence, if you were to do numerical solutions of the schemes because you're doing several type of approximations. But uh, I'm sure that there's some structure 
into this so that there's particular uh, uh, methods that may be better than just some sort of brute force. And also another interesting topic is second order expansions in many topics in economics that are sort of needed because of the, the nature of the, of, the, of the questions. And finally, let me just say that these are very simple models. If you read papers in economics, you will see that people typically use a bit more complex models and they end up just solving numerically. So one thing that a more realistic application, even of these sort of problems where you have, um, um, we are say controlling a Brownian with fixed cost, they typically will have say two states, one that when it's not controlled, it has a, you know, it has sort of, uh, is deterministic. So this has some degeneracy that is, uh, um, not sure it will survive this analysis, and but it will be very helpful um, to think about it. And also a lot of more realistic applications have both uh, drift and impose control. I'm not sure if there is any inter in interesting interaction between the two. All right, so let me just finish saying that this is a weird talk. It's mostly questions as opposed to answers, but I hope that this will uh, foster more interaction. Fernando, was a very nice talk. Are there questions in the audience? So let, let me shoot um, uh, first. Uh, so, so, uh, uh, on your last example, you explained that there were two uh, two equilibria and one uh, which is uh, when linearly stable and the other one which is not. Okay, would you expect that if you uh, if you perturb a little bit the un, uh, unstable one, you converge to the to to the stable one or something like that? As we don't, we don't know, I mean, because we only know something about these uh, perturbations of these sort of local dynamics. We chose on purpose also this example, everything is compact. So, you know, we have this sort of, so, you know, what will be the dynamics? If you start with a distribution, uh, will you go there or will you go somewhere else? Uh, we don't really know. Uh, we don't know how to think about it. Uh, and uh, we are eager to, uh, to explore it more. Uh, just out of curiosity, so, so when you talk about equilibria, you really think that so, that's something which is, I mean, uh, in principle, should be something stable, right? I mean, uh, if, exactly. if you see it, if you see it uh, in economy, right, this is what you expect. Huh? So the idea is the following. So if you have, say, say you have, you take a static game, and there's a game in which you have a strategic complementarity, you don't have monotonicity it's very easy to imagine that you have two equilibrium. Let's just take a stationary equilibrium. It's also easy to think about the same forces giving rise to two equilibrium. Now, if one of these equilibrium is not locally stable, so if we start with a distribution that is close by, but we don't get attracted to that one, we think that this is an equilibrium that is irrelevant because unless you start exactly there, you will never see. It. So we find that as an interesting uh, result. Uh, and we like to think whether this sort of something more general about it, we just don't know. Uh, I'll, I'll come back Charles, with other questions, uh, but uh, I see that Charles has a question, yeah. yes. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the talk, Fernando. I don't know if there are like questions, but more a uh, bit of uh, comment on your, on your talk. Mm -hmm. the, the, um, the fact that solutions are not exact, are not usually uh, uh, classical, but uh, maybe they are like weak solutions or whatever. Mm -hmm. In, uh, I mean, for for instance, in your first example, because you're you're stuck between those two boundaries, like we mm -hmm. clearly expect that the solution is a uh, is classical in the open mm -hmm. interval. Yep. So usually, all your formal computation or well, in some sense, they are quite correct because the even the second order derivatives, it's just that you have to be careful right. to always compute it on the interval. But this, yes. I, I think, I think it's not it's not an issue here. Like you, you don't have much. Fine, you do not have to to worry about this. But um, you were asking for numerical methods for uh, weak formulation, and I think that uh, it's um, it's quite possible uh, using um, an analogy with a social planners problem. And uh, you you should you should have a look at at this kind of method because there, in some sense, you you look at the 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 optimization problem of the social planner, and you want to. To well, you, you will to find the equilibrium. You are going to minimize it, and um, what you do is that the, the problem has a lot of constraints because uh, of this uh, impulse control. But uh, if you if you relax those constraints, in some sense, you observe um, you you what you get are, are weak solutions of the equation. So solutions which are still uh, physically uh, economically acceptable, and those method are maybe. At least they are, they are well suited, for instance, for like uh, discounted stationary, uh, discounted problems. Or... 
And, and Charles, you're, you're thinking more of uh, setups more similar to your earlier papers or more similar to this one? I think that this we are talking most, yeah. mostly about this other case, right? Uh, yeah, for, for like the, your second and third case. Yes. I think your, your first case, like you, your numerical methods are... No, no, that one... I, we, I, don't, I don't think you can improve it like... Uh, and you're right. I mean, that when we try to solve it, I mean, it's a little bit different the level of understanding because Takis is a co-author in one paper, and you could imagine that somehow in the paper where Takis is a co-author, we understand things much better. For yeah. Some reason. yeah, I see. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and and also your your um, your comment on the, the fact that uh, sometimes we have like a uh, uniqueness uh, for theta large, even if it's uh, well if it's in a, with your eigenvalues. I mm -hmm. think that it's uh, somehow closely related to a. Uh, a paper of uh, Marco Tuvent on the uh, bifurcation theory for uh, anti-monotone uh, for anti-monotone minfield games, because if I if I'm correct, so so the idea of the paper of Tuvent is that you 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 get the parameters and when you your theta and when you get theta large enough, maybe you if you look at the the graph of all the possible equilibrium mm -hmm. with theta, maybe the the graph diverge and you have some additional branches that pop up, and here but outside the, the value of bifurcation, each branch is very stable. And it's, it really looks like what you're, you're doing because uh, your x hat is uh, somehow the stability of the equilibrium. So it's, uh, it's quite natural to, to, rec to recover the fact that between the two eigenvalues of the, of the operator, your equilibrium is still stable. Because maybe, but maybe there are several, like the several equilibriums can be stable it's not a contradiction. I mean, uh, I, I see what you're uh, saying. Yeah, it, it would be great if you uh, send me the reference. It's just my own ignorance. I mean, yeah, yeah. Noise, it's just yeah, my yeah. Uh, yeah. I send it to you. No problem. Yes. But but you're right. I mean, I didn't go through the planning problem, but uh, it is sort of somehow also better behave the planning problem is, as you could imagine, very similar, not exactly the same, but, but we just took exactly the same um, point of view that you suggested on um, basically having the Lagrange multipliers that of relaxing each of the constraints. And, and that one is sort of well behaved. Yeah, okay. So I don't know if there are question, other questions online. Uh, ju ju just uh, otherwise, um, out of curiosity, so, so you, what you did was you, you were linearizing the windshield game system, right? And I remember Bilal's talk uh, uh, in Chicago where he was linearizing the master equation. Um, is there any substantial difference between the two or? Right, so, so Adrian was really looking at drift control problems. So, uh, so that's the main difference. While well, these ones are all kind of, uh, these problems we have these barriers. And indeed, I mean, as sort of you expect, he ended up solving then to be able to solve them, then he has these sort of like nonlinear equations. He has this sort of like uh, operator is quadratic, which is the analog to just having a, let, let's even forget about the mean field game, think about a, um, a planning problem, or think about a Hamiltonian. You, know, you linearize it and you end up with some sort of quadratic equation, which you need to pick up the right root. While these problems, you actually end up with a linear equation. So they are kind of different, the structure of it, the linearization. Again, this is for a mean field game, but to me, it's an analogy with linearizing around a steady state and looking for, say, the slope of optimal decision rules around a stationary point. Then you get like a quadratic equation. And that's what Adrian was getting. While here you get linear equations. Uh, it's just- yeah, that's true. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't quite, I understand the mechanics. I don't really know how to explain them better than that, uh, which- that's, just, that's a little bit yeah. puzzling indeed, yes. So I think Charles, I don't know if he's still your hand up or he has a, another comment. No, I think, Charles, you, are you, have you questions again or what? No, no, I, I'm fine. No, 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 it's just a hand up, yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you again uh, for this very nice talk.